So let's get back into our text of Mark 3. So then he looks at the Pharisees and he gives them a warning. Jesus' family thought he was a lunatic. The Pharisees called him a liar. Jesus stood his ground and said, no, I am Lord. And then while he's got these Pharisees huddled up, he says, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Now, this teaching of Jesus has stirred up a lot of questions. I would say near the top of the list of questions that I have been asked during the the 15 years, the 16 years that I've been a pastor, this one is somewhere in the top. What's the unforgivable sin? Have I committed the unforgivable sin? There's Christians that lose sleep over that one. Have I committed the unforgivable sin? What is that? Is it murder? Is murder the unforgivable sin? Or maybe adultery? Is adultery the unforgivable sin? One I get a lot is, uh, is suicide. Is suicide the unforgivable sin? That gets a lot of attention because the Catholic Church teaches that you cannot be forgiven from suicide. So what, what is it? Is it a combination? Is there sins bad enough that we can commit, that we can never be forgiven? And it makes us nervous. We want to know the details on this one. We want clarity on this one because we wonder, what if I have committed the unforgivable sin? What is it? Well, let's start with what we have. We know that the unforgivable sin is blasphemy. We at least know that much. It's a sin of the mouth that is expressing the attitude of the heart. We know that the unforgivable sin is not murder or any form of murder because even King David committed that and was a man after God's own heart. He was not condemned to hell as well as adultery. So we know it's not those types of actions. Certainly they are sins, but they're not out of the realm of forgiveness. It happens in this realm of blasphemy, and therefore that excludes, by the way, suicide as well. Suicide certainly dishonors the Lord, and it throws away the beautiful gift of life that He has given to us, but it is the action of a broken mind. It is the action of despair and hopelessness. It's a very sad thing, but it is not the unforgivable sin. So it's blasphemy. Well, what do we mean by blasphemy? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. So I think we have to ask another question, and then what what is this blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? I wonder how many of us are guilty of the sin of blasphemy. God wants his name to be revered. Jesus says in the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy, sacred be your name. We honor it, lift it up, exalt it, protect it. We certainly don't blaspheme it. And yet, there are those in this room who have done that. Some of us have the habit of doing such things. So it is, we need to get clear on what blasphemy is and what this is when it's gone too far, when it can never be forgiven. So let's look at the clues in this passage. First of all, these Pharisees were fully enlightened. No one knew the word of God better than a religious leader in the days of Israel. No one knew the word of God like a Pharisee. They often had the entire Old Testament memorized. There was nothing hidden from them in the Old Testament. So the word of God had been made plain to them in its fullness. They understood the word of God. Beyond that, 
they saw the power of the Holy Spirit being demonstrated in the life of Christ. They watched the miracles. They saw the authority. They saw his power over evil spirits. They weren't blind to this. They weren't confused. They could see what was going on. They were fully illuminated. And I think this is the danger that Jesus is speaking about. When you come to the full realization of who I am, and you understand the depth of my works and my power and my message, and you understand the Word of God, and your eyes have been opened to, to all that I am, and you come to the final realization, not true. I reject the message of Christ. This is deception. It's a lie. He says, be careful, men. You are coming up against a sin that cannot be forgiven. Be very careful about what you are saying. Remember, he had these fellows huddled up with him right now. He's warning them with the authority that he often taught with. He is looking at them and saying, you are about to cross a line here, fellas, that is going to seal your destiny and darken your soul, a place from which there is no return. If you see me with all the light there is to see me and come to the conclusion that you're coming to now willingly, there's no return from this. Be careful. The book of Hebrews actually elaborates on this. There's some real squirrely verses in the book of Hebrews. It makes theologians squirm a little bit because of its harsh language. Warnings that pack such a powerful punch. It was written to first century Jews, that's why it's called Hebrews, who saw the works of Christ, who understood the gospel, who had witnessed the resurrection, and yet they were unbelieving. So the writer of Hebrews had some very strong warnings to give to them, and I want to just run through them quickly. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says this, So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Himself and then delivered to us by those who heard Him speak? For those of us who have heard the message of Christ and seen His ministry and seen His power, what makes us think that there's any escape from the judgment we are due for our sins if we reject this? In verse 4 it says, God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever He chose. There's been ample evidence. You've seen the messenger of God. You've seen the King of glory, the Lord of all. And yet you're unbelieving. What makes you think you can escape if you ignore this great salvation? Really strong words. Then Hebrews chapter 6 has some strong words to follow this. It's, and this Hebrews is really a sermon, so it's just building on this point. Hebrews 6 verse 4. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who are once enlightened, at speaking of what the mind knows, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come. They've tasted it. I don't know if they've eaten and drank of it, but they've tasted it. They've become very familiar and intimate with it and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing Him to the cross once again and holding Him to public shame. These are people who have come into the full knowledge of who Jesus is. They've seen the demonstrations of the power of the Holy Spirit. They've seen the goodness of God. They've tasted of the authority of the message of Jesus. They, they sit there and they see it all. And the author warns, if you have all of this and you turn away from God, there's nothing left. There's no hope for you. There's no plan B. 
to reject Christ when you've seen his authenticity is a sin of blasphemy which grieves the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see this in Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26. The final passage I'll read from here. Again, strong words. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled the Son of God, who have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. This is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you see Christ for who He is, and you hear the truth and the authority of His message, and you continue on in a life of sin and reject that, there's nothing left to save you. If you look at all that Jesus has done, and you hear the message of the Bible, and you say, this whole thing is a farce, what salvation is left for you? There is none. This is an unforgivable sin. To behold Jesus in His authority, His righteousness, His love for us, and His message, and to reject it, seals our fate for all eternity. Now, to get back to the original danger, the, the original struggle that people have, well, what if I have? What if I have somehow blasphemed the name of God in some way where uh, I don't know if I can be saved, I don't know if I've lost my salvation? There's, there's this verse in 1 Timothy that Paul tells young Timothy that I want to bring to your attention. It's 1 Timothy 1.12. Listen to this. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do His work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve Him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. This is Paul the Apostle. In my innocence, I'm sorry, in my insolence, I persecuted His people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Pause. That's the difference between blasphemy and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy that Jesus was speaking to is these men that were confronting him and accusing him of being in league with Satan. They were not doing it out of ignorance and unbelief. They saw the power of Jesus. They saw his authority. They heard his message. And they chose to say, we reject it. And the only way that we can reject this in front of the people in a way that makes sense is to say, you're in league with Satan. Paul rejected the message of Jesus many times because he honestly, in his ignorance, did not understand it. But he said, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with that faith and love that comes from Jesus Christ. So you can blaspheme God. It is a dangerous thing to do. But that does not place you in a state of hopelessness. In fact, I would say this tonight. If you are someone who worries that you have committed the, un the unforgivable sin, then I will assure you, you have not committed the unforgivable sin because if you had you would be antagonistic towards Christ not tender towards him you wouldn't be worried if you were offending him you'd be glad to do it for one who has blasphemed the Holy Spirit we tread on the work of Christ as though it was nothing we reject it and we say the whole thing is deception that's our proclamation and there are many who do it. It's a sad thing. 
But God says if that is the final resting place of our faith after we've seen all that there is to see from the Word of God and having our minds opened by the Holy Spirit and illuminated and seeing the power of Jesus and we just say, ah, the whole thing is laughable, it's a farce, it's a lie. Jesus says there is no hope for you. There is no plan B. There is nothing left. You have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. You have grieved Him and you will stand before God one day and give an account of your blasphemous words. So this is not something that we can accidentally do. That's what I want you to hear. Those who are looking at Jesus on this day were confronted with who He was. Was He a lunatic as His family originally thought? Was He a deceiver and a liar? as the Pharisees accused him of being? Or was he actually the Lord that he claimed to be, the Lord of all, the Lord that we will give an account of our lives to, the Lord that came to to earth from his throne in heaven, declaring the message of the kingdom of God that he was here to take souls from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light. And he was going to do that by dying on a cross and paying the price and the penalty of our sins and freely giving his righteousness to anyone who would believe and anyone who receives the righteousness of Christ is brought into the kingdom of God and is forever protected and saved. It's a marvelous message. 